Psalm 27 is a is a wonderful psalm of trust. It is a favorite of many. It's uh, like Psalm 23 in many ways, uh, a psalm where David declares his trust in the faithfulness of God in a variety of contexts. Uh, the psalm begins with these statements of confidence. It really divides into two parts, verses 1 through 6 and then 7 through 14. The first uh, half of the psalm states the psalmist trust in Yahweh. The second half is uh, a cry for help uh, from Yahweh and, again, a restatement of that trust. The first half of this first section of the psalm is about trust in battle. As David describes the Lord as his light and salvation, his stronghold, he describes armies camping against him, adversaries going to war. So he trusts God in the battle. The next three verses describe God providing shelter for David in the tabernacle. And uh, this word tabernacle obviously makes us think of the tabernacle and later the temple where um, the Ark of the Covenant resided, where worship was centered. But given the fact that the, there's reference to encamping and battle here, it's also possible that there is a, a, a double meaning here or a sense also that God uh, conceals and protects David uh, in his tent, even when David is on the battlefield. Uh, so that tent language might apply there as well. Second half of the psalm uh, moves back and forth between request and trust. He makes the request to be gracious, answer me. He declares, I'll seek you. Again, don't hide from me, don't forsake me. Uh, verse 10 is a statement of trust, the Lord will take me in. Once again, he returns to request in verses 10 and 11, and then concludes with a statement of trust. The name of God occurs many times in the psalm, a total of 13, uh, where Yahweh occurs in 14 verses. Uh, so, And just like Psalm 23, which begins and ends with the name of the Lord, so does Psalm 27. We also note how the beginning of this psalm is similar to Psalm 23 as well. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Similar to this metaphor, the Lord is my light, my salvation, whom shall I fear? Uh, so there are definitely some comparisons there. Also, Psalm 23, 4, which references the, the valley of deep darkness by declaring that the Lord is my light. This is something else that we need whenever we're going through a dark place. We not only need a shepherd to guide us, a leader, but we need light, and God is both of those. Also, another echo of Psalm 23 is found in verse 4. I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, uh, in, uh, uh, echoed in uh, from Psalm 23, verse 6. And there we have verse 4, 5, and 6, these references to the, the tent. Uh, this uh, is a common theme in Psalms 23 through 29, and so that shows up here as well. Again, looking at the second half of the psalm, we see the names of the Lord occurring again in almost every verse, along with the uh, designation, O God, of my salvation in verse 9. Verse 8 likely refers back to the previous verse for uh, you have said, seek my face, and that is the plural of seek. Uh, so you have said, uh, all y'all, every one of you, seek my face. And my heart says, your face, Lord, uh, do I seek. And that echoes what he said in verse 4. Verses 9 and 12, he prays not to be forsaken uh, before his enemies. And then verse 10, in the midst of those two, gives a statement of confidence that my father and mother may forsake me. And some translations will state that as as a, as a hypothetical, uh, even if they forsake me, the Lord will take me in. And, and if you think about it, your father and mother were, will likely be the last person ever to forsake you, no matter, no matter how awful uh, you might be, no matter what you have done. It's very hard to escape the love of a parent. And David says, even in the very unlikely case that my parents would disown me, the Lord will take me in. Now, of course, this becomes very real for Christians today who uh, suffer persecution and, and uh, ostracism for uh, uh, turning away from the religion of their family. They will find uh, this verse a tremendous comfort to them, I believe. Verse 13 says, I shall look upon the goodness. And you might uh, look back through the psalm and notice uh, the many references to looking, to seeking, to gazing, to beholding uh, God. And of course, you need light to do that. Hence the first line of the psalm, the Lord is my light, uh, enabling us to see him. Uh, verse 14 uh, could be taken as self-talk, where David is speaking to himself, encouraging himself to wait for the Lord, or it could be instructional. He could be uh, speaking to the, anyone that would be praying this prayer as well and encouraging them to, uh, to take heart. 
uh, the editor. We've noticed already that uh, Psalm uh, 23 is very similar to Psalm 27 and also Psalm 16, our first Psalm of Trust. We also will note later that this corresponds with Psalm 31 and uh, that these Psalms, 23 through 29, that seven Psalms all have references to the temple or the, or the dwelling of God in some way. And here we see the structure of this entire group of 10 Psalms with the center of the Psalm being on the hymn, Psalm 29. And there you see the two Psalms of trust that correspond to one another, where David says, I'm confident of this in Psalm 31, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now moving to the lens of Jesus, and it's not too difficult to see Jesus in the Psalm as well. Jesus had some things to say about light. In fact, he declared, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And he'll say that again in John chapter 9. Uh, when he heals a man who is uh, born blind. So he brings light into this man's life to demonstrate uh, the reality. So the miracle proves the words of Jesus are true. He is indeed the light of the world. And so when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, uh, the good Jew listening to that would say, wait a minute, Yahweh is light, Psalm 27. Jesus, therefore, is claiming to be God. Yes, indeed he was. This is why they wanted to kill him. As we look at the lens of the New Testament, uh, the verse 4 comes to mind, and uh, the references in 2 Corinthians 4 and other places to light. Uh, John uh, makes uh, quite a big deal of light in uh, his epistle of 1 John as well. Uh, but here you see that the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You know, the glory of God uh, can refer to his brilliance, his brightness. And if you think about it, it's it's sort of like looking into the sun. Uh, we cannot handle looking into the sun. If you look into the sun for more than a few seconds, you will damage your eyes. Uh, a few years ago, we had an eclipse in the U.S., and everyone who wanted to look at it had to have special glasses to protect their eyes. Uh, so by analogy, uh, perhaps uh, it's appropriate to look at Jesus as something like those eclipse glasses or or some sunglasses that allow us to see the glory of God without destroying us. Uh, the, the overwhelming holiness and the glory of God would, would be utterly burned and consumed before him. But through Jesus, we see God. He is the image of God. Uh, we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus is that, that filter, that, uh, those eclipse glasses that allow us to behold the very face of God. Pretty cool. I love verse 4, one of my favorite verses in this psalm. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek. And it begs the question then, what is your one thing? What is the one thing, the prime mover of your life? Rich Mullins has a wonderful song called One Thing. And the chorus states that you're my one thing and the pure in heart will see God. Jesus said that, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount. And what a promise that if we seek him, he will make himself known to us. And uh, this is a, a wonderful prayer uh, that we would focus uh, our attention, our affections, our worship on the Lord. Seek him in his temple. Likewise, in the second half of the psalm, we would say uh, with David, my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. And we're reminded of the, of the promise that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount. Ask and you'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. And there's promise that if we seek the face of the Lord, we will we'll not be disappointed. Verse 10 uh, reminds us of the fact that God will never forsake us. This is a, an older scripture. It's actually quoted from the book of Deuteronomy originally. The writer of Hebrews quotes it, I will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do of me? Seems to be some echoes there of Psalm 27 in the Hebrews text. And then finally, by way of application, the, the psalmist says at best, wait for the Lord. Be strong, let your heart take courage, and wait for the Lord. Be patient, be comforted, be strengthened uh, by these promises. And, and this is actually an echo of something that Moses said uh, to Joshua uh, back when he was transitioning uh, from leadership uh, to Joshua. He said, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened, don't be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That same promise is true for us today. So, Wait for the Lord, be strong, take courage, and wait 